Hello, I'm April Jones, and we at Jones Law Firm care about you, your family, and your well-being. That's why we've put together this informative webinar series to answer your questions about life, about the law, about your family. So thank you for joining us, and let's get started. Welcome. Um, welcome to my amazing Jones Law Firm lawyers, Jessica Crawford, Grant Bursick, Tamina Mahedas. We are here today to talk about the great debate. We get this question all the time. I'm April Jones. I am the uh, CEO and founder of Jones Law Firm. We've been serving Colorado for over 23 years. We do family law. And today we are answering and discussing one of the questions we get all the time. We get this comment from clients who get this comment, like if you happen to be talking to your Uber driver and he's talking about support or parenting time, you just get it everywhere. Get this question. So the great debate, is Colorado a mother or father favoring state web webinar? Thank you for all the participants who have sent in questions in advance um, and you can send questions while we're talking today. So um, I introduced me, why don't we go around the attorney room, um, introduce yourself, and then we'll get started. Grant. Hi, my name is Grant Bursick. I live here in Denver. I've been practicing law since 20, 2008, excuse me. <clears throat> and I, I enjoy doing family law because I like helping families through difficult times um, to help remind them that we will all get on the other side of this. Love that. Thank you. Jessica. Hey. Hi, my name is Jessica Crawford, and um, I've been practicing law since 2019. And um, like Grant, I, I do want to help people know that they can get to the other side of those difficult times. And, you know, also one of my earliest memories, and I shared this in my bio on the website, is participating in a family law case. Um, my mom got married when I was about three years old. And so I got to talk to a judge about, you know, changing my last name and, and my stepfather adopting me. And it was just a really positive thing in my life. And so I do feel like, you know, going through the family law process can be a positive thing when you do get to that other side. So I'd love to help people get through that. Thank you. Mina. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jimena Moedas. Um, I've been an attorney since 2020. I uh, started out as a criminal defense attorney. Now I do family law. Um, obviously a lot of differences, but also a lot of overlaps in these two practices. Um, I enjoy a lot of the negotiation and just building relationships with my clients. So they always know that I'm there to support them kind of no matter what they're going through. And even if, you know, the law or the judge isn't necessarily on our side, you know, at least they know that they're, they've got a team there for them. So excited for our little webinar today and answer whatever questions you guys have. All right, thank you. And so we can start by going around the room. We'll do a quick uh, answer of the question of, in your opinion, is Colorado a mother or father favoring state? Grant. Sorry, um, I don't think that it favors mothers or fathers uh, one or one over the other in any way. Um, I think it's a pretty even state. Um, and I think it really comes down more to your judge than anything else. Jessica. Um, to me, it seems like Colorado law is pretty even handed and it's going to depend on the particular facts of your case. So how much time you're spending with your child, things like um, how close you live to the school, um, you know, if there have been any, you know, court cases that might indicate that um, one parent is maybe more safe than another parent. So I think it's all about documentation and um, just having lots of evidence to prove, um, you know, maybe which parent should get more parenting time. And it seems as though the courts are gonna generally favor the best interests of the child and that they do, if all things being equal, try to split it fairly evenly, in my opinion. 
Thank you. Hamina. Yeah, so I mean, I think that the law is written in a way that obviously is a default of shared or joint custody, as we call it. And I think that that is a fair, um, you know, expectation to have is that the court will default to this joint custody expectation. Um, but I think, as my colleague stated, it is very fact dependent, right? Every family is different. Um, every co-parenting dynamic has its own difficulties and nuances. And so I think that we have to approach every case, you know, individualistic in depending on the facts. Um, it's going to depend um, how a judge perceives you and your family and what's best for your kids at that particular time. And that ebbs and flows as a family's dynamic changes over the years as well. So what might make sense for your kids and be in their best interest today doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, a year or two down the line, it can't change. So I think that that's something that is good to keep into perspective when you're, you know, going through this really difficult process. Uh, thank you. One of the things that, like when the court's taking into consideration the facts that are presented before it, some of the things that you're going to bump up against is you've got a new baby and you're a nursing mom. So is it father's rights? Or is it mother's rights? Or is it that you've got a new baby and you're a nursing mom? And is it in the best interest of the child to, you know, the newborn to be with the new mother who's the nursing mom? Is that father's rights? versus mother's rights that we're analyzing and fathers have less rights or is it, it's in the best interest of the newborn child to be with the newborn mother and be with the nursing mom. Like you can categorize it as father's rights, mother's rights in some instances, like if we really drill down, but at the end of the day, it's still the best interest standard and what's in the best interest of the child, what's in the best interest of the newborn um, and, and how does bonding work and, what happens if a, a newborn sees their parents every other week? Are they able to bond in the way that um, the social scientists and the therapists say is best for a child? So you will bump up against fathers and mothers, but it's it's nuanced. So we're not saying, we don't know what you're talking about. We're just saying, you gotta look at the facts and you've gotta you know, play the hand you're dealt in a strategic, thoughtful way. Viewer question, what are the chances that a Colorado court can take the kids away from their mother and give more time to the father? This viewer is worried that their manipulative husband um, is going to be manipulative and that he'll try to take the kids away from her. Uh, who wants to start? Amina? Sure, I mean, I think that um, it's a, it's obviously always a difficult question, right? This idea of taking children or this perception that we're taking children away from one parent and, and giving them to the other. When I think we have to sometimes reframe that into it's, it's not taking necessarily from one parent and giving to the other. It's just, it's dividing. And unfortunately, when, when families are in this very difficult situation, a judge has to center what's best for the kids and um, judges will almost always tell you what's best for the kids is to have positive relationships with both parents. Obviously, if that's not possible to have with one parent or another for, you know, certain reasons, then a judge will address that appropriately. Right. But we have to sometimes, you know, uh, you know, pull away from this idea that it's, um, taking away, but instead that it's adding something positive to the children's lives to have two families that love them and two families that can support them. Obviously every case is different. And so that might not be the situation. And, um, you have to be very kind of clear with judges about what that manipulation might look like. Is it a manipulation of the judge themselves or is it of the children and kind of what that, what differences that makes, I think. And when you look at the question even closer, when you say take more time from mother and give it to father, what are we really saying? There's 365 days and nights. And are we saying that you had half of them and now you're going to have a third of them? Or are we saying that you had 90% and now you're only going to have 80%? So it really depends. Are you saying, and, and when I use percentages, it's probably a harder way to analyze this. If you have, if the dad has every other weekend, and now they're going to move to have every week. And 
So you've got to look at different things. Like if they do have limited time, why? Why do they have more limited time? Do they have an alcohol problem? Did they travel from work and they're never home? Did they never bond with the children in the first place? Is there some sort of abuse? What are the facts that have that are playing into why one person has more or less time? And then if you are going to have less time, did the I, I'm just going to go with my more drastic scenario. Did the person who did have some sort of dependency um, prevail over it and now they don't. And so now they are more fit and proper to parent. Did they change their job? Did they travel all over the place? But now they move, you know, 20 minutes away and they can actually exercise parenting time. Did they get treatment? Did they, you know, fill in the blank? Like we could, we've been doing decades, we can fill in the blank of the different reasons that would move the, the needle to where parenting time is shared differently. And you would need to have more details. It's way more nuanced. And what we do is we look at your facts, we think about it strategically, and we try to move the needle in the way that works best for you and your family by, by doing so. Let's jump to another question. What about children being under two years old? Assuming she only nurses 30% of the time. So I guess we have the mom only nurses 30% of the time, child's under two. Currently, mom is a stay-at-home mom by choice because we're able to accommodate that. Once divorced, um, this dad wants as much custody, even if it means the ex-wife is going back to work, is that something the judge would even consider? So we have a child under two, we have a mom nursing part of the time, we have parents who decided, hey, mom's not gonna work right now, but they're getting divorced. Grant. So uh, this is a, obviously sort of a, very specific and unique situation. Um, just because a family decided that one parent was going to stay at home with the child during the marriage, um, if the parties are getting divorced, a judge is not going to <laughs> enforce that arrangement moving forward because obviously circumstances have changed. Um, in Colorado, it is expected that both parents financially support the children which means having a job. Um, when you have a child under two and there is nursing, generally you're going to see the mom initially get more parenting time than the dad. Um, that said, the court will also typically then try and build what's called a step up parenting plan. And so say dad is only getting 70, uh, sorry, only 25% of the overnights at first. Over the next year or so, it's not uncommon for a judge to build a plan. So that goes from 25 to 30, 35, and now 50%. Um, as the child gets older, as the child stops nursing, then assuming no safety concerns and both parents are appropriate, most judges will want to get the both parents then to equal parenting time fairly quickly. Thank you. Does anyone want to add or want to go to another question? Thanks, Grant. I think that was a good general comprehensive answer um, that applies generally to when this comes up. The, we have another question. There's a three-year-old child, the mom and a dad. The dad hasn't had much um, interaction with the child because mom kind of kept has kept the three-year-old um, away and they haven't been able to communicate. They don't have court orders. This is very common. You have a child, one parent is the primary parent. They could have created the situation where they are the only parent, child's young, three years old. And now you have, we'll just say dad, as in this instance, saying, hey, I want to be involved in my child's life. What is the court going to do when this dad who has not been involved now wants to be involved? I mean, yeah, so, um, I mean, I think the first step is you do have to get the courts involved. Um, that's really the only way to get orders that can't be um, changed by the opposing party. So that's what's called an allocation of parental responsibility action. So essentially, that's going to a judge and saying, look, this is my child. I want time with this child. Obviously, understanding that having been separated from them for that period of time, um, is going to require uh, what we call reintegration therapy, most likely, um, and some kind of easing in, similarly to what Grant was just talking about, this step-up idea. Um, you know, this 
very little child doesn't know you as much as, as they know their other parent. Right. And so it can be a real shock to the system, just dropping them into uh, dad's house for, you know, three nights out of nowhere. Right. So a judge isn't going to just do that so easily. Right. So they're going to do a process to ramp it up, but you know, as we discussed previously, judges, if there's a parent that wants to be involved and is fit to be involved, a judge will do their best to facilitate that. And uh, once you get those orders in place and you get this step up plan and you execute it properly, now you've got, you know, all the makings to get a good parenting plan to allow you to have consistent, meaningful parenting time with your child. Um, in a way that can't really be interfered by the other person because now it's been dictated to you by the court. Uh, yes. I do want to add that we're giving general advice. The specifics vary often. I mean, the, each county has its own court system. So you've got every county and then whatever judge is there. And then, so it's, you know, who you're, who's in the robe that you're asking that day. And one scenario that, I'll give you an outlier scenario so you can see how you've really got to personalize this. What if mom now is um, on meth and not caring for the child and you're the father? And now, the, and there's the APR where in um, Jimena's st an, um, story analysis, you're not going to get the child typically like, oh, here you're with a good fit, proper parent mom. They don't know you at all. And you're not going to get the child so much without, you know, some analysis on the part of the court or some step up. If the, there's, if the child must go somewhere and you're a good, proper, fit father, the court is making is is weighing different things to decide where's the safe, best interest place for the child to go. So you can see how it could be now in the child's best interest because they're otherwise in an unsafe home. We prefer a safe home with somebody who you're not quite bonded with than um, then you be with the person you're bonded with where it's unsafe. So this gets nuanced. Just want to put that out there as we continue answering and discussing these questions in general. And this one will, Jessica, do you have recommendations for how both parents should prepare for a family law case to show that they deserve parenting time? Sure. So I think some of the best things that you can do, first of all, is showing that you have had parenting time in the past and how it's going currently. So if you have any kind of current parenting time, for example, you're spending time with your kids, taking them to their extracurricular activities, you have phone calls with them and, and that kind of thing, you're going to want to document that to show the court, okay, this is already something that we're doing. Um, otherwise, you're going to want to take a look at some of the uh, best interests of the, of the child factors that are out there and you're just going to want to show that, yes, this essentially is in the best interest of the child. Um, you can pretty much imagine that they're going to be things that are like, um, you know, is the child is the child safe with you? So um, are you a safe person? Are you in a safe area? Have you had any um, issues in the past um, as far as like criminally or protection orders against you. Um, something else that you're gonna wanna take into account is your child's age. So sometimes if a child is old enough, say that they're around the age of 12, then they can also share with the judge how they feel about you. So if you have a good relationship with your child um, and your child is older, then uh, the court may consider uh, speaking directly to the child to see how they would feel about an increase in parenting time as well. Thank you. Uh, next question. I, just, oh, yeah. to, I, I wanted Go to add it. something too about how to prepare for a case. Um, I think it's really important when you're preparing for a, a divorce case, a family law case, and there is going to be this child children component to demonstrate to the court that you can both put the child's needs ahead of your own and that you can encourage your child's relationship with the other parent. Um, being able to demonstrate that you support your child's relationship with the other parent is going to go a really long way to demonstrating that you should have a significant amount of parenting time uh, with, with your children. Yeah, that is one of the factors in the court deciding who to 
allocate parental responsibility to is the ability to encourage the love and affection between um, the parent and the uh, the other parent and the child. And the other another criteria that Grant is referring to is the ability to put your needs, the child's need ahead of your your own. So those are factors that the court has to weigh against the facts of your case. So thank you for adding that. Jimena, do you, anything you want to add? I don't think so. I think that that kind of covers it all. I'm a father. It's the father in this question. How do I prepare for a CFI? How much does location between parents matter? And uh, then last, it's what is the recommended parenting time for a two and a half year old? So that's got a few things in it. Why don't we start with preparing for a CFI and location? Grant, you want to take it? Sure. Um, bluntly, I think the best way to prepare for a CFI investigation is to have an attorney and work with an attorney who's worked with clients through numerous CFI investigations. Um, they are going to want, the CFI is going to be wanting to witness, come into your home, witness your interaction with your child. Um, they're going to want to talk to friends or relatives who can speak to sort of your strengths and weaknesses as a father. Um, if you've had any sort of mental health treatment in the past, you'll want to get those records um, to, to, to give to the CFI. A lot of it is just getting the paperwork that the CFI will need ready and being timely um, in those requests. In terms of location, if both parents are within the metro area and say within a 20 mile radius, location is not going to become a significant factor. It is a factor that the court has to consider as part of the best interest. But realistically, if you're within a 20, 30 minute drive of each other, um, you don't have to worry about location. Thank you. Anybody want to add anything to that? I think that one thing that I've seen come up a lot with CFIs is, and, and that I've seen CFIs kind of hone in on during their investigation is, is this idea of being able to um, promote love and respect between co-parents. Um, it is one of the things that CFIs really, really want to see from people. So, um, you know, not everybody has a great relationship with their co-parent and CFIs know that, but um, you know, they're going to ask you, what do you think your co-parent's parenting style is? Uh, a response to that probably shouldn't be, you know, something super negative, right? Try to find the positives in your co-parent's parenting style, even if it's not similar to your own, right? And being able to do that will show the CFI, look, this is a parent who is doing their best to make this work because that's what's best for their child. And that reflects really well in their report. And then in turn, really well on the judge because judges do give those reports a lot of weight. So that's something that I've seen come up a lot recently is, is CFIs really asking a lot of pressing questions about what you think about your co-parent. And it's hard not to get kind of stuck in that. It's a bit of a trap and we just don't want you guys to get stuck in that. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, I think both Jimena and Grant made great points and, you know, especially about working with the an attorney through the CFI process. Um, one of the things that the CFI is gonna wanna do is they're gonna wanna talk to people who um, have associated with you, um, have seen you with the child. Okay, so that can be like things like teachers, you know, neighbors, church members, things like that. You can actually like offer to the CFI some people who can talk to them and like kind of explain your relationship with the child too. And um, you can talk with your attorney about some people that you were thinking to, who can speak with the CFI um, on your behalf to just kind of um, put, a, put an accurate light for your relationship with the child. Thank you. Okay, so- And it will look like oh, that sure. you are followed up with what if the, the distance between them is two hours apart. Um, and especially if you have a, a younger child or preschool age child, that will impact a parenting time schedule. Um, it's gonna be pretty difficult to, it'll be more challenging to do an equal parenting time schedule if you're two hours apart at that age. Um, and so then, 
it becomes what can I do to try and figure out my schedule to get as much time as possible? Um, and where can I make some sacrifices in order to get more parenting time? Because that two hours is a significant amount of, of distance at this point. And a lot of it depends on the child. I've had cases where um, the parents wanted to meet halfway and the court allowed it. Um, and I've had cases where somebody wanted the child to drive because the child child's still driving the whole way. And the child got car sick. The child didn't like being in a car. Then I have another one whose client, my client used to say, oh, she's built to balance. My child's built to balance. And she loved being in the car and going back and forth. And it worked for her. So it is case dependent, but two hours, but it's, it's, I mean, two hours is an analysis. It could be a no. I, you could have a judge who's like, I don't believe children should be in the car that long. Um, you could have a judge who's like, it's more important for the child to actually be able to see the parents if they can. Um, or here's one where the parent, the one parent goes to the child for their parenting time. They could, I've had clients stay in hotels, not recommended, but they could afford it. They did it. They got the time. I've, you know, you stay with your parents. You, you know, which parent has resources in the other parent's location? So at least some of the time, the child is not on the road. So maybe, you know, one of your two exchanges, you spend there. Like you can get creative if you want to, um, and if it if it matters enough to uh, try to solve for the problem, you can get creative and move to be right next door. Like there's all sorts of things you can do. But you have to, you know, what are the limits of your situation? Is it your job? But can you work virtually? Um, and and then that can open up a whole world to 50-50 parenting time if you can change your geographic location to something closer. And sometimes and this dovetails with the question that we have here. It's someone who um, wants to have more parenting time. But they were the they were the working father. We get this a lot. We have one parent. Uh, we'll just go with typically the father. We'll just go with the real typical, general generic kind of a case. Plus, that's the question. Works all the time. So doesn't know the doctors. Doesn't know the teachers. Um, doesn't take the child. I mean, I'm expanding on the question. Doesn't take the child to and from school. Doesn't take the child to play date. All sorts of things. Doesn't take the child to the dentist. But you, you're the breadwinner, you earn the money, that's how the child is able to go to the dentist and have play dates and, and uh, go to this private school where you don't know the teachers. I did a blog uh, years ago that is still a good blog, it's still on point. It's tips for good fathers in, in um, bad custody disputes. And it talks about, it gives tips for know the teacher. Like once you're separated, it's not your ex's job to like be your mother be your updater this is what the dentist said this is what the teacher said it's now your job to know that information yourself you no longer have that dynamic so if your point is i now want to be a full parent and we're no longer together so i no longer have the advantage of this division of labor where you tell me you know oh she got pink rubber bands at the orthodontist today, so as soon as you see the child, you're like, I love your pink rubber bands. You don't have that anymore. If this is, if you're changing your family dynamic, and so you need to change the rest of the dynamic, which is, like Grant, I think, was saying that, you know, one parent, the other parent would need to go to work if, um, or at least be assigned an income. The court will impute income. They can't make you go to work, but they can impute income based on your ability to earn. So now we've got income coming in from the other side, and on your side, you need to get your kid to school, learn the teachers, learn the dentist, and get the information yourself. You go to the school, you put your name on whatever list that lets you get all the information. You don't wait for mom to get the paperwork and then hand it to you, and then you hand it back to mom. There's so, yes, you're going to get in the game. You didn't have to before. Now you will. Um, we walk people through that, walk parents through. These are some, some of the steps. If you're going to move out, Please get a some place the child could sleep at your house. It, if you get get a bunk bed for the den, you know, um, prepare for it. I love if I if I get to pick, I'll have you get a place that's on the um, bus line, the school bus line. So now the child can take the bus and go straight to your house. 
So there's just, there's a lots of ways to think about this and we help with that. Anybody want to add to that question? Yeah, I think that that was perfectly said, April. It's just that I wouldn't be super concerned that a judge will hold it against a parent that they were the parent who was making, you know, doing the work and as a consequence couldn't be as involved. Um, you just have to now, once the case starts, show now how you are becoming involved and you should quickly overcome any challenges associated with that. Right. By the time you get to trial, which these days is nine months, 13 months, uh, you shouldn't be on the stand failing the question of who's your child's teacher? Who's your child's doctor? Who's your child? Like, by the time you get to where you're being asked that, you've had time to to get involved, which is Grant's, Grant's point. So um, absolutely, you can parent your child in that scenario. Okay, we will do one more question here. And we'll go back to our basics. What are, because we're still getting the question, what are father's rights? And is there, a, no, we've answered that. Is there a difference in who gets more physical custody, mothers or fathers? I think not based on whether you're a mother or a father, generally. Um, Hamina? Yeah, I would just say that there's no, I mean, I think people have a preconception that the courts and the law favors moms. Um, that's just not the case. Uh, the law is not written that way. Judges are not meant to interpret the law that way. Um, the way that it's framed is the best interest of the child. And so, you know, this idea of physical custody or parenting time, whatever we're calling it, it's, it's what's best for the child. And so um, every, like we said earlier, every case is different. Um, that's obviously not always the answer people are hoping to hear, right? Uh, but that is that is the system. That is how it works. And so it is about putting your best foot forward and showing the court that you are what's best for your child, right? And, or your children. And um, the ways to do that is to be an active parent and put, you know, all the effort that you can into that. Um, outside of just being, you know, a monetary provider for them. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, and and I did want to weigh in because when we first uh, got this topic, I was kind of wondering, okay, how do people get this idea, you know, of the mother like being preferred? And so I looked some, I looked up something. Berkeley Law actually published this, and it does show that like pretty much before the 1970s, there was a trend, a judicial trend that did prefer mothers in custody disputes. But then starting in the 1970s, there was this swing. And so ever since then, like courts had been moving forward towards this like equal status. And that's something that is pretty much here in Colorado. There's definitely no, no statute saying that a mother is preferred over a father. And in fact, there's actually statutes saying that there's going to be no preference based on the sex of the parent. But I definitely don't want to like gaslight the clients because at one point, like in history, there was a preference, but now it really is like Jimena said, and like Grant has said, those best interests of the child. I would say to that point, that's a very good point. Um, I've been practicing over 30 years and if we go back two decades, there was I used to, the daddy package where the dads had every other weekend and a dinner visit. That was what was more typical. And then gradually over time that, you know, 50-50 became what's typical. So now I can't say that there's a point in time where I thought, because I like what you're saying about not gaslighting the clients. There's not a point in time where I thought, huh, Mothers get every other weekend and a dinner visit. That there's not a that point in time. Like you had two fit and proper persons to parent, you have to make a decision. Let's give mom every other weekend and a dinner visit. Um, so yes, life, society, things change. The statute definitely says without regard to gender, parenting time should be decided without regard to gender. Grant. Yeah. 
I think we're all on the sort of the same mindset here. I would just say that I think the the term father's rights is bluntly, I think it's just a marketing term. Um, you know, both parents have rights to the children. Um, and I think that some law firms have used that term to just market themselves in a different way. Um, and that you really, as a father, um, and speaking as a father, you don't have to be overly concerned that if you were to have a divorce case, that a judge is going to limit your parenting time just due to the fact that you're a man. Good point. And when I, I used to do a lot with father's rights, say 10 years ago, 12 years ago, um, I think there's something online where I'm in a video and I'm talking about father's rights. And the thing from then till now, what it meant to me is I, back then, I didn't have to go and talk about mother's rights. I didn't have to say, oh, you're a fit and proper person parent. You can, you mothers should be able to have more than every other weekend in a dinner visit. Never had to, didn't have to say that. So mother's rights or mother's rights, and you didn't have to say you as a mother get rights, but you, we did have to say you as a father are a fit and proper person parent. You can have 50-50. You can have this. You can have that. And really put that before the court. I think what we've evolved to um, today, 2023 versus 2000, is, yeah, that standard um, It's expected that the parents are going to come to court and they're going to say, you know, this is what's in the best interest of my child. And, um, and, and it has become something to more market father's rights. Um, but it also, sometimes you get dads who do need help getting in the game and being the nurturing parent, being the present parent, being the, like our caller who asked about, who said they're, they're the breadwinner and they're not home. We still have stay-at-home moms and working dads and the working dads still need to know this is how you get parenting time. So that's my answer. All right, on that note, this was a fun, the Jones Law Firm, great debate on mothers versus fathers' rights. And the video will be available. We're here for questions. We're Denver Divorce Attorney. Dot com if you want to reach out to us on email, um, check us out on social media. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. If you or someone you know would benefit from watching a recording of this webinar or any of our other webinars, they can be found at DenverDivorceAttorneys.com. Thank you and keep a lookout for future live webinars and I hope to see you again.